Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's uh, Zoom lecture. My name is Searle Breitman. I'm the director of the English Language Desk of uh, um, Yad Vashem's International Relations Division. Uh, we're very fortunate this evening to have Dr. Sharon Kanjasa Cohen, who is the editor of Yad Vashem Studies and the director of the Eli and Diana Zborowski Center for the Aftermath of the Holocaust at our International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem. She will, be de she will be delivering the lecture on uh, children during the Holocaust. Um, Dr. Kanjasa Cohen was the former academic director of the Oral History Division of the Avraham Harman Institute of Contemporary Jury at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She holds a PhD from the Hebrew University in the field of Holocaust studies and is also a lecturer at the Rothberg School for International Students at the um, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She has published numerous articles relating to the post-war lives of survivors of the Holocaust. Her most recent work is the publication of the post-war diaries of child survivor Yehuda Bacon. Finally, I would just, before Sharon begins, I, I would just like to mention a, a brief vignette. I once actually worked with a child survivor. And I'll never forget his words to me. He said that he was a survivor of a concentration camp. He said that the experiences were so, I don't even know what the adjective is, but let's just say they were so extreme that he said parents actually lost their parenting instinct. That's how powerful and how bad things were in the concentration camps. And we can't even begin to imagine what he meant by that. So over to you, Sharon. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sir, uh, and thank you to all of the um, organizers of this Zoom event from the uh, Public Relations Department of Yad Vashem. Um, I'm not sure who's in the room, so for those of you who I, I know, uh, hello, uh, thank you for joining, and for those of you who I don't know, um, thank you for joining as well. Um, and uh, we will begin... Um, uh, the, the discussion really of um, the issue of Jewish children uh, during the Shoah. Now, the title obviously is a big title. Jewish children during the Shoah is really a um, warrants many books and probably the most uh, important work that was written, which established the field was the uh, important work by Deborah Dwork, Children of the Star which in the 1990s established the field as a field in particular relating to um, a certain victim group of, of the Shah, that being the children. And it took many, many uh, decades for uh, the experience of children and the voice of uh, the child, child the experience to enter into the greater historical uh, story of Jewish persecution and victimization during uh, the Second World War under the Nazis. And, um, I would say that one of the um, important uh, things to remember is that history is written at, at different times and people become is interested in particular topics at different times, which is based on, uh, on numerous factors. Um, and I think that but one of the uh, factors that contributed or, uh, to the writing and to the study of children as a separate victim group uh, related to the point at which uh, children who were survivors of the Nazi period um, came to uh, begin speaking themselves uh, about what they had experienced uh, at a later part in stage of their lives, which is linked to all different, um, uh, is, has many different reasons and triggers for that. But essentially what we, what we see is really a convergence of the readiness and the openness and the willingness of, of survivors who were children during the war to begin to speak about their experiences more openly, identify publicly as survivors, and therefore also triggering, I would say, uh, on one level, uh, a historical uh, uh, inquiry into uh, the issue of children. Now, the issue of children, as Deborah Dwork uh, points out, essentially, and we um, can also see when we visit the the Memorial Museum of the Holocaust at, at Yad Vashem is that it essentially represents uh, the quintessential experience of the final solution. The idea that children that were seen as a racial, biological, existential threat to Nazi Germany, um, that these 
individuals uh, were seen as a, as a target for murder and annihilation, in a sense encapsulates the, the centrality of uh, Nazi anti-Semitism and the idea that essentially that the Jewish uh, people and its people who would be able to continue uh, the Jewish people would essentially needed to be to be murdered, even to the point at which um, we know that um, during the ghetto period, uh, women who were found pregnant after a certain period were also targeted uh, where pregnancy became illegal. The idea that an unborn fetus is essentially a threat ideologically and needed to be um, removed uh, in this crystallizes and essentializes essentially what the, when the Holocaust was all about, is about the murder of the Jewish people, even uh, an unborn fetus. And I think that with that uh, idea, uh, we, uh, we can launch into discussing very some of, some of the issues that come, come up in, in research. Um, we can't cover everything. We can't uh, touch and discuss um, all the different aspects that uh, that relate to the experience of Jewish children during the Shoah. But I want to uh, start off by saying that the idea of killing Jewish children uh, as part as central to Nazi, Nazi racial ideology is, is, is really, uh, one could argue, the quintessential experience of, of the Shoah itself. Now, another part that we need to think about is that for the most part, Jewish children who are living in Nazi occupied Europe and who are targeted uh, for, for murder essentially the majority of them are victims of the Shoah. They are um, essentially, uh, for most part, for the majority of them are murdered uh, by the Nazis and uh, other people and other groups who were involved in, in, the, in the persecution and murder of the Jews. And so the sto stories that we hear of uh, the survivor from survivors who are child survivors is really represents a very, very small uh, minority experience. It cannot in any way encapsulate the experience of Jew Jewish children because these are really the very few lucky ones who managed um, to survive the war. And even after surviving the war, um, at some point they decided to record their memories and tell their stories. And so one of the issues that we face um, when uh, we look at the experience of children during the war is what, what sources essentially uh, can, we, can we relate to? Which sources can we rely on? And this is also once again put forward very uh, eloquently by Deborah Dork, who in the quote that you can see be, uh, on the screen is that essentially it's a fragmented story because not only are we talking about the majority of Jewish children who are murdered who will no longer give their story uh, after the war or has opportunity to relate their story after the war, but also that bureaucratically children fall into an undocumented category. Um, that essentially that they are objects of policy and they never become part of recorded history. They are appendages uh, to their parents and they're not seen as individuals in their own right to the point that, as Deborah Dork uh, states, they're not old enough to wear stars. Uh, at, at a certain age. And so therefore they are, and they're undocumented. Bureaucrats who administered the final solution did not see children as person or a problem in their own right. They were appendages, as I said, and it, especially to their, to their parents and especially to their mothers. And thus 90 degrees of this period gives us very little information about the special dimensions of, chi of child life. Now this is very, very important because a lot of what we know about the Shoah is about, is comes through documentation, contemporaneous documentation that's created during the war itself. And we're trying to investigate this, the story of children. What sources can we have? What, 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 what do we have essentially? And Deborah Dwork uncovers and, and, and many, many, many sources that eventually uh, find its way into remarkable work. But we need to keep in mind that essentially it is an unrecorded history for the most part. A, due to the fact that the majority are murdered and B, due to the fact that the majority aren't writing down or traces do not remain or bureaucratically they, their fate and their identity is not always uh, recorded. So the question therefore is where do we get a sense of what happened to Jewish children during the war? What are our sources? Obviously we know that for the most part, the survivors or child survivors during the war uh, children in the war who survived the war and are now child survivors gave testimony, uh, post-war testimony. 
and uh, which is an invaluable source. And we know that for the most part, um, many of the testimonies we have in recent decades are from child survivors. And so we have a reflection of children on their past and with, uh, with a very, very long uh, period of, of time between the event and uh, the retelling. And we know in terms of the field of oral history that oral history is a memory of an event and is constructed within a certain context. And um, children, are, so child survivors are really speaking decades later and reflecting on what happened to them uh, when they were children. It's a vital, important source, but it is one that we need to think about uh, the issue of perspective uh, very, very deeply when we, when we analyze and when we use uh, oral histories. One of the um, amazing, um, I'm just gonna just skip that for a second. One of the amazing sources that we have of, the ch of children's uh, recollections of, or of what was happening at the time during the war itself is part of the great uh, project of, uh, the on of Onik Shabbat, the Onik Shabbat archive from the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, established by Emanuel Ringelblum in the ghetto itself. Uh, Emanuel Ringelblum, himself a historian, who gathered um, a group of people to essentially record what is happening to the Jewish people uh, in the ghetto. And this is essentially most of what they uh, record is before the deport great deportations of 1942. And they have a very, very, very clear understanding that they need to be able to collect and record what they're seeing and experiencing uh, around them in this massive, uh, massive ghetto of the ghetto of Warsaw. And essentially, they divide a, um, they begin by collecting all sorts of whatever they can in terms of documentation of, 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 of all sorts. And it's a, and it's a, and it's a talk in of itself, but one of the at one point they realize that it's not just about collecting what's happening in the ghetto. They also have to go proactively and uh, see for themselves, interview them, the individuals who are living in the ghetto itself. They need to create a project in where the voices of people who are experiencing the history or experiencing, experiencing the ghetto later the history uh, basically give a record in the ghetto itself of what they're experiencing. And one of the groups that the Ringel Bloom, uh, the Onik Shabbat, points to. Uh, is the, is the experience of children who are imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so what they do in 1941 is they distribute a questionnaire, how the war, war changed our lives. Now, we have to always remember that when we're thinking about what people are recording in 1941, they're recording one, 1941, obviously, the experience of the world in which they are, which they know, or which they are, are familiar with at that point in time. There is no perspective of from 1945 looking back knowing the end or the beginning of the end of the story which another story begins after 1945 for survivors of the Shoah however they are looking at what do they know about the environment of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1941 and so the whole issue of deportation to uh, predominantly to Treblinka the whole issue of resistance or an uprising later is not part of their experience they're talking about ghetto life. And we know that in 1941, we know, we understand from uh, history that, that, that it's really about surviving, surviving the ghetto. What does surviving the ghetto mean for the, you know, on the most basic, basic level? Surviving the ghetto means uh, food, having enough food uh, to survive. And then, you know, there are all sorts of different parts of life that becomes, is created in the ghetto itself. But Ringel Bloom and his colleagues say, okay, this is a specific group that we need to capture uh, their impressions and their experience. And so there's a questionnaire. Where had they lived before the war? What had their parents done? Did their parents encourage them to go out and beg or did they try and stop them? Why did many children seem to prefer living in the street to a relatively secure life in an institution? So these are some of the questions that they are being asked, the children in the Warsaw Ghetto. And what's interesting is that we have here a, a, a larger question. We know that very early on, survivor testimony was focused on how did, how did you survive? What we have see here is really, you know, Ringelblum and his colleagues trying to get a greater context to a child's life. Where, had you, where have you lived before the war? 
Obviously, the cultural aspect of a child's life, the socioeconomic status, uh, their education, their upbringing um, is something that the recorders want to see as important information. We need to know who these people are coming into the ghetto. Also, in a way to understand how and if they react to ghetto life and, and, and conditions. And the different socioeconomic classes and education and all sorts of religious affiliations and identity are very much part of the identity of Jews, of Jews in the ghetto. And we want to see, Ringel is saying, we want to see who this population is and how it's being affected. What's important, I think, for me, why I chose one of these questions is that the question of did their parents encourage them to go out and beg or did they try to stop them? And it sort of hints at, at what Searle, uh, uh, Searle's opening words. What we have here is a situation in which, as I said, the basic issue in a ghetto situation is food. And we know that it's all different ghettos have different circumstances of, 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 of the amount of food and if food uh, was available and how it became available. But we know that in the case of the Warsaw Ghetto, that smuggling was really the main way that people were able to survive. Smuggling food into the ghetto because what was rationed was not enough to survive on and therefore food had to be smuggled. And what happens in the ghetto is in other ghettos, in Warsaw in particular, and it becomes very emblematic, is that the child becomes the smuggler for all sorts of reasons. The child becomes a smuggler going into the Aryan side, smuggling food back in and at endangering their lives, essentially, because if they're caught smuggling food and bringing it to their families, they will be killed. And here comes the very, very difficult and as what Lawrence Langer has, has infamous, infamously termed the choiceless choice, what, 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 what kind of family decision-making and dynamics takes place? As a parent, we're sending our child out in order to support the family at the risk of them losing their lives. And yet, if we don't send the child out to support the family, then we will starve in the ghetto. And whether or not the child at some point doesn't even ask a parent because they don't want to put the parent in the situation of having to make that decision or don't want to accept the parent's decision and therefore takes on their own in, in initiative in, to smuggle food into the ghetto. And this is where we see what the beginning is of what ghetto life is, is a the beginning of the flipping of the roles in terms of a family structure. When our children are now becoming providers and caretakers, either with the consent or without the consent, uh, of, the, of their parents and parents having to be in the situation of having to send out the question of whether to send out and risk their children's life or risk their own lives or other dependents in, 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 in the household. So this is one aspect of where we see the beginning of the shift in terms of, of the roles that, uh, and the role that, that children, children take. And the, sec and the last question, why did many children seem to prefer living in the streets to a relatively secure life in an institution? Why are children living in the streets? Which children are living in the streets? What are the institutions that are being created? And why do children, in this question, it seems to indicate, prefer, prefer the streets? And what happens in the streets with children in groups? And, and how do they live and how do they survive? We know that for the most part, that the most uh, vulnerable uh, uh, Jews in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, particularly, are those who are refugees who have come from smaller uh, villages uh, and towns and have been uh, deported, essentially, to the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, really come with very, very little to trade and to barter, very few connections, very few ways of establishing themselves and live essentially as refugees in huge in, in huge. Um, temporary sometimes housing facilities in which the suffering of these Jewish refugees was, was, was the greatest, especially in the, in, the early, uh, in the early war years. And what you, in, in, sorry, in the ghetto years, and what you see here is really uh, the street life of people essentially living on the street and being the most vulnerable in terms of, of hunger and poverty. And children enter this. Why do children enter the street life? Is that essentially, for the most part, their parents, uh, their parents, their parents die. They die of hunger or they are taken and they find themselves orphaned and alone. One of the responses from the Onik Shabbat archives is given in Samuel Kassau's book, uh, 
on the Onyx Shabbat archives. And he quotes uh, Rivka Zelter. And this is her response to one of the questions that is asked. So she says that before the war, I was happy. I lived on Ostrovska Street. My father worked and I went to school on Stavsky Street. In 1939, the war started and I stopped going to school. We began to be hungry. We started to sell our things from home, but we quickly ran out of things to sell. My father could not hold on and died of hunger. I thought that my mother would survive the war, but she could not hold on and died. So I became an orphan. I found out from friends that there was this day center. I tried to get in. When they admitted me, I was very happy. Children are being orphaned as a result of starvation and poverty, and therefore are finding ways to fend for themselves, and in circumstances are being able to be looked after in some of the centers that are established uh, by Jews in the ghetto itself. I did, sorry, I just um, can't, um, I just need to move back, but the, uh, I couldn't read the whole uh, slide before. So Alexis, could you move the slide back if you are there? No? Okay, so we'll move on to Dvora Frymet. Now, Dvora Frymet is a, a testimony that is given later on, right, in the post-war period, after Dvora has uh, been liberated. And this is really a collection that is taking place in 1946 uh, with the Jewish Historical Commission who are interviewing or conducting interviews with children who have survived. Dvorah relates to the fact that essentially we have the same kind of situation where children become caretakers of, of their parents. We were poor before the war, but now after father's death, we had nothing at all to eat. When we moved into the ghetto, we had our furniture, but in this room we had, where we had to live, there was no room and the furniture was in the courtyard. I and my siblings were glad that we were moving. It was great enjoyment for us to take the furniture and different things out of the apartment. My mommy cried a great deal then and said that we were going to our death. She buried the best we had, the Passover dishes, because she thought that maybe one of us children will survive and will take the things perhaps. Mama was sick constantly from worry. My older brothers had, had to carry her to the ghetto because she could not walk to our new apartment. Other Jews could gather staples, but we had no money. Mommy and the children were swollen from hunger. The ghetto world that exists essentially even as late as 1944 and the last ghetto is liquidated, is a world that is still has some sort of recognizable reality or some vestige of a home and a family life. That even though you have a situation of excessive deprivation, of illness, of hunger, of people who are dying all around constantly, of people who are losing uh, psychological and, and emotional capacity to manage a daily assault that in fact just gets worse. Each day is worse than the next. It still has a semblance of some recognizable reality because for the most part, children are with or in some sort of family structure or in some sort of home life where there is some recognizable routine for those, as I say, who are, who are able to not succumb to hunger, who are able to smuggle in enough or to work and get enough to survive on a basic level. But the ghetto world is really one in which the begins a shift as we talk about the changing in, of roles of children as caretakers. There is the shift, obviously, as we looked at in the slide before, of children becoming orphans and therefore having to find a way to fend for themselves as orphans. But there is still a semblance of something recognizable. This changes obviously very dramatically when children begin to have to leave the ghettos 
they leave the ghetto either through deportation, which is, is another uh, store, part of the story. And they also leave in the ghetto um, in order to hide. They are being hidden either through networks of organizations, depending which country um, they are living in, or they are being hidden uh, uh, or being arranged to be hidden by their, their families, their parents, or the extended family, or they are being hidden by total strangers. The hiding experience, as much as it is a huge adjustment and a huge undertaking for the rescuers or the people who are, do, are hiding the children in terms of finding their place, locating them, finding a way to give the children that are hidden food and ways to conceal them and survive. The challenges for children in hiding are immense. Are immense. They're immense because essentially a child from a very early age has to pretend or learn to be someone else. And in many instances, the child is unable to uh, be engaged in any activities in which he or she could be identified as a Jew. So that we know that for many children who are saved in hiding, their experiences is one of darkness, being hidden, um, not having any sort of routine, not having any sort of social interaction or connection, um, because essentially they need to be isolated in order to be concealed. Now, obviously within the spectrum, there are different experiences. Some children in, in hiding have a relatively better experience than others. And there are some who are rescued and will give their testimony of a very uh, important period in their lives in which they were looked after and nurtured uh, by very loving and wonderful human beings who did everything they could to be able to still give them some parts of life that their children, their children wanted. And yet there are others who suffered incredibly difficult uh, situation of, 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 of hiding, uh, whether it be physical or uh, or emotional or sexual abuse, to um, not seeing daylight for months, weeks on end, and sometimes years, to the, the fear of, um, for example, one of the survivors that I interviewed, uh, a woman by the name of Ariella Palace, who passed away a few years ago, few years ago was hidden uh, in the French countryside by a woman who was a avowed anti-Semite that uh, used to go around blaming the Jews and hating the Jews and all that Ariella was concerned about is that in the night time during the time when she was sleeping that she would reveal herself a Jew, as a Jew by shouting out in her dreams for her parents or revealing her true identity. Ariella Palace lived in, in severe fear in, that, that she would be found out that in fact uh, her rescue was saving a Jewish uh, child to the point that one Ariella Palace was, risked, was was liberated in the sense that her father had come back uh, to find her after the war. Ariella Palace uh, remembers sitting in the classroom and seeing her rescuer um, walking in with her father who had come to find her. And once um, he had revealed to the rescuer that she in fact was a Jewish child, Ariella Palace uh, fainted and uh, doesn't remember anything afterwards. That was the extent of the, of, of the fear that she had in, in not revealing her identity. So hiding um, has elements of a recognizable world for some, but for many, it becomes a very, very uh, difficult uh, experience that is one of not only physical endurance in terms of the conditions, and we know many stories of how people in, in, in all sorts of, 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 of ways uh, manage to to, to, to hide, but also a psychological and emotional endurance of, of, of being hidden and hiding one's identity and, uh, and who one is. And that is really the majority of the experience of child survivors. Most Jewish children survive the war as a result of hiding. And hiding doesn't only happen necessarily once. A child can be hidden multiple times and have multiple experiences. And that's one thing that's very important when we think about anything that has to do with the Shoah. There is no general common experience in the sense that we can say there were some people that 
were hidden or there were some people that rescued and there were some people that behaved good well and some because even within the same experience itself a person could endure endure good people and bad people being hidden successfully or not being hidden successfully but not even just in terms of a person's experience between people a rescuer could be hiding a jew and could be turning in another the same person could be doing different things a any individual is acting and reacting to the circumstances and to their context and so really when we look at the individual story we can see how much more complex and complicated human behavior is and not necessarily can we connect it to a certain type of personality or trait that we can uh, use to try and understand how people did and how they responded and how they behaved during the war and not only in terms of rescuers in terms of the victims themselves and even in terms of ter the perpetrators people reacted differently in different situations and that's why the individual story is so powerful in that it reveals. The un unrecognizable reality is really once a child uh, and also adults start seeing uh, confronting death and death on a, a mass scale, not just in terms of hunger, but death in terms of, 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 br of brutal murder and, and annihilation. And when asking child survivors for the most part, why hadn't they spoken about their experiences until much later on? Many of them talk to the point is that, that they, even though they might have experienced a difficult hiding experience, they hadn't ex witnessed mass death. They hadn't necessarily, some of them been in a ghetto like Warsaw where they saw death on the streets and they hadn't witnessed mass ex executions and they hadn't seen a concentration camp or a death camp. And for them, that was the boundary between separating themselves from other survivors who witnessed mass death and annihilation and murder uh, on, a, on a daily basis, if you were, if you were a, a prisoner in, 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 in these camps. And for them, that separated them. And their claim to being a survivor or their feeling of being a survivor of, of equal significance, we would say, hierarchy of suffering, was uh, the fact that did they witness uh, murder? And yes, there were obviously children who witnessed murder. Edward Kiddingsburg, I went to the window and saw the whole scene. I could see through the window that there was a cemetery there and there was a grave dug out there. And on the grave lay a plank and on the plank stood six people. The Gestapo men shot at them with machine guns. Terrified by the scene, I began to scream, Mama, Mama heard Mummy heard me and told me to be quiet or we will be shot and she went away. One of the questions that we look at when we study children during the war is what, what do they know? What do they know is dependent, as Yehuda Bauer says, generally for victim groups, is, is what information did they have about what is happening around them? But then when does that information become knowledge? When do they understand exactly what this all means? And obviously that question is going to be, I would argue, very different for an adult than it, be, than it would be for a child. Because children are very much dependent on what is communicated and translated to them and told to them in order to understand what is happening. And that filter, which is usually through the adult world, as children grow up generally, not in a war situation, and even more so in a war situation, is filtered by an adult and whoever that adult, significant adult might be at that point in time. And therefore what they understand is very much dependent on what is being told to them and what they, and, and therefore what they can know about what is happening. So we have children understanding based on what the parents are telling them. But what we see as testimonies move on in terms of just, um, in terms of the duration, in terms of as the war develops, is that for the most part in the beginning of the war, children understand what's happening. It's filtered through their parents. They sort of get whatever story is being passed on to them. But once they start being confronted with, with their own eyes, whether it's starvation or whether it's uh, disease, but most importantly, in terms of, 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 hung, of, of murder and death, then they start, um, then they start understanding it on their own and, and a, a parent can try and filter or try and, and, and 
reframe. However, the reality is so much, uh, it's so much, it's so unavoidable that that the child, whatever whatever capacity they have, will have to confront um, confront the fact that people around them are being murdered, and in fact, they could be murdered uh, murdered themselves. Um, so the conference, so the meeting with confrontation with death, is um, one thing that would uh, definitely uh, talk about a, a separation in terms of of, of of a child's understanding of what's happening, but also in terms of their own identity and the way they relate to themselves as survivors. And then we enter the world uh, of the unrecognizable world, the world that is completely a, a world in which children, adults, elderly are, are confronted with uh, absolute, um, absolute evil in the form of a factory of, of, of death, of, of death camps. Um, in which, you know, for the most part, children who are arriving at a place or being deported, arriving sounds a little banal, but who are being deported to a place like uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, for the most part, children are not going to be selected to, to live and will be murdered on arrival. Um, and very, very few children uh, who are either concealing themselves or who are concealing their age or being concealed by others uh, are selected to enter into um, the, lab, the, labor, the labor section, the labor camp of the death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, which is the concentration camp, but they're used as forced labor. So what happens, what happens in this world is, is something that um, becomes um, obviously unrecognizable. Um, and for children, the, the ability to survive, as I said, is almost, uh, is almost impossible. But we do have children who enter uh, this world and we have children who survive this world. And one of the children that uh, I mentioned is Yehuda Bakon, whose uh, diaries uh, that we are publishing, his post-war diaries we are publishing. Um, and Yehuda Bakon has been a survivor who has spoken for most of his life um, because he is um, connected to essentially the story of this unrecognizable world. And he was able to articulate um, what he saw and what he experienced, not only through uh, his diaries and his testimonies, but predominantly through his artwork, because he is, uh, he is an artist. Um, and so Yehuda Bakon, and I'm sure some of you have, may have heard me talk about him in this particular story, but for those of you who haven't, it, it really is a remarkable story of a young boy who is incarcerated in Auschwitz. And he is uh, eventually separated from his mother and his sister and his father, all three of them who don't survive the war. Uh, his father and him go through a selection and his father is selected uh, to be murdered and Bakon is selected uh, to remain in uh, the men's camp alive. He knows that his father has been murdered. And after being in the camp, uh, he realizes what the camp is about. And he, at some point, befriends uh, members of the Sonderkommando, the, those individuals who are working in the gas chamber in the crematoria of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And Yehuda Bakon, at some point, and there's many parts of his testimony where he actually um, uh, is in the area of the vicinity of the gas chambers and crematoria, and, and, and he goes uh, and he sees the outside, and he also sees the inside of of the installations. And after the war, he sketches what he sees. He sketches what he sees, which is important because it becomes a very fundamental piece of testimony as to what happened in Auschwitz-Birkenau because it was destroyed. And he becomes this witness to what was really the interior of the center of, of murder of this, of, this massive, of this massive camp. And Yehuda Bakon, he, he, in many of his testimonies, he tries to convince the Sonder Commando to let him in to see the inside. And they say, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, you, 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 you know, why would you go in there? You know, you're a young boy or so, all sorts of reasons. And he says, I need, I'm curious. I need, I need, I need to witness. I need to see, I need to see. And he, and he convinces them to, to, to be allowed into this space. Now I'm going to bring up something that's, interesting just in terms of Yehuda Bakon and this story. Because when I meet Yehuda Bakon today, and I'm very fortunate enough to be able to meet him 
and speak to him on a regular basis. Yoruba Khan tells that one of the most difficult things he experiences today as a survivor of 90 years old is the fact that when he tells the story of how he managed to see the interior of the gas chamber in the crematoria, that people don't believe that this happened that people don't believe that a child could be, have been let in to this installation and don't necessarily believe the story he's, he gives. Now, Yudhubha Korn, if you look at his testimony, straight after the war, even to this day, this is the story he tells. He hasn't changed his testimony. He talks about how Kalman Fuhrman um, allowed him into the gas chamber and crematoria. And what bothers him and what I would even say, go to far as to say is torments him, is that he doesn't feel that the audience that is listening to his testimony believes, believes him. And this is one of the issues that child survivors faced after the war, is if they tell their stories, will they be believed? Will people say you were too young enough to, you were too young, you won't, you can't remember? Will they say, you know, it couldn't have happened, you might have imagined it, or you didn't really suffer, or you really weren't there. Children's memories were not seen as reliable. Children's memories in terms of the, the, the perspective of, of time were not seen as reliable. And many children, many survivors of children in the war decided to not talk about the experience in fear of not being believed. Now here you have a survivor who was given testimony for most of his life time and time and time and time again, at post-war trials. His evidence is, in, is, is, is essential for uh, the David Irving Lipstadt case. And today at 90, he says he's concerned that people don't believe him. That is one of the deep, deep uh, issues that he is grappling with at the end of, in the later, in the later part, stages of his life. The fact that a child went into this area, which which is um, quite remarkable. Um, I wanted to end off with a, um, a YouTube uh, clip uh, that I don't know if it, when I share it on the screen, you can, you can see it. If so, you can tell me that you can see it. That would be... So, can you see it? No? So, I do recommend you all looking uh, at the website of the Polin Museum in Warsaw, which created a, a wonderful collection of uh, testimonies. Uh, one of the testimonies that was uh, created is given by a woman by the name of Sally Wasserman. Sally Wasserman uh, lives in Canada. And she, um, I was fortunate enough to accompany on her on a few of, of um, educational programs to, to Poland. And she tells uh, essentially the story of her, of her rescue and of her being hidden. And she is hidden uh, by a Polish Volksdeutsch, uh, uh, an ethnic German Polish man who is living in the town, in the area of, 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 a, of a ghetto and comes to read the meter the electric, electric meter in the ghetto. And at some point, finds Sally Wasserman, starts talking to her and it starts to bring her food. At some point he asks if essentially he can meet her mother. He meets her mother. And the story is, is that they basically decide that once it becomes too dangerous uh, for Sally and for the Jews in the ghetto itself, he would like to take, uh, he would like to rescue her and hide uh, her with him and his wife. Sally Wasserman has a mother in the ghetto. Her father had uh, been taken uh, earlier on and she has a younger brother. And at some point, um, Mr. Turkin approaches her mother and says, essentially, she says, this is the time I need to take Sally. Sally is basically smuggled out of the ghetto and is hidden with the Turkins till the end of the war. And her mother and her brother are, are deported from the ghetto and eventually are taken to another ghetto to be then deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau where they are murdered. 
Sally Wasserman, for most of her adult life after her liberation, is very, 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 very upset and very, very angry with her mother. She's very angry with her mother because she feels that her mother chose her brother over her. Sally eventually went on to live in Canada with her mother's sister and didn't lead and didn't live a very easy life in terms of relationship with her aunt. And also with the fact that she felt that um, her mother had left her and abandoned her, even though she had had a good rescue experience, but then was taken away from her rescuers and taken to Canada. Sally Wasserman lived with lots of anger towards her mother until one day out of pure circumstance, seems to recall and eventually find a letter that she had carried out of the ghetto with her, a letter that her mother had written to her sister in which she told her of the great sacrifice she had made in giving Sally up, but knowing that in giving Sally up that she would save her. And the comfort that saving Sally would give to her in her final hours, because she knew that her fate and the fate of her young son was not, was not decipherable, was deportation and it meant, <clears throat> meant death. Decades afterwards, Sally reading the letter of her mother that was written in green ink, handwritten, hidden for many decades, revealed at Sally's later age, was she able to then understand what her mother had done? She was fortunate to have her mother's voice to be able to calm her and say, what I did was try and give you a good life, was trying to save you. That, that is my love for you. <clears throat> and Sally Bosserman now is able to understand her mother in a way that she never could while growing up. So even for children, who survived the war, what happened during the war, even though they experienced it, how it was experienced and what it meant and its meaning sometimes only comes many dec decades after and it becomes, and it's, and it's a, con and a continual process for those lucky, fortunate ones who managed to survive this ter this, these terrible years. And thankfully we have them with us to be able to share their experiences and their stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, folks, if anybody has any questions for Sharon, we still have a few more minutes. So perhaps you'd like to just write your questions in the chat uh, and Sharon will be very happy to address them. Okay, here's one question. How many child survivors are still alive today, Sharon? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how many child survivors are, are alive today. I'm sorry. We'll have to do some research and figure that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were some of the child survivors reunited with their parents? There were there were there were survivors who child survivors were united with their parents. It wasn't it wasn't easy to be reunited. People were distanced and uh, lost track and trace of each other. But yes, absolutely, there were. Um, even, I mean, Yehuda Bakon was reunited with his sister who had come to Palestine before the war, which was then mandatory Palestine. So people did find each other. Um, How did these children later reconcile their Jewish identity? Well, as I, as I mentioned before, when we talk about um, people, we talk about individuals and everyone has a different uh, response and reaction. Uh, for children who... Um, we know, for an example, for the, in, say the case of Ariella Palace, who, who, who claims she internalized her rescuer's anti-Semitism. She couldn't bear anything uh, Jewish or being part of the Jewish community after the war, and she was very, very much um, living very separate, uh, separate existence until she talks about the fact that when she, when the Six Day War happened in Israel, she felt she was felt a trigger that of an existential um, threat that the Jewish state would be wiped out, just like uh, what she felt was happening during the Second World War. And all of a sudden she became, she felt a very, very, very strong Jewishness that 
existential threat brought her back to her Jewishness. And eventually she would talk about how she would go to the, the airport and, uh, and watch the Al Al planes take off and land just to see the, the Makin David on its tail. And eventually made, uh, made Aliyah move to Israel. But her, it took time. And I would say the children in hiding with Christian rescuers, it was it dependent on, on, on what type of environment it was. Um, and if you were, even if your parents came back. Um, so very, very individual, I would say, but there are some survivors who didn't want to have anything to do with being Jewish um, after the war. It was a cause of the victimization and they wanted to get further, furthest thing away from their, their, their Jewishness. Um, so we have, a, we have that as well. And we have people and, and individuals coming back to Judaism or becoming more religious. So it's all very individual, but even within the individual, it can change over, over time. Which is, which is interesting. Erin, do you have a book recommendation for people who want to learn about the history of children during the Holocaust? I would definitely recommend Deborah Dwork's Children with a Star. It's really a, it's a wonderful piece of history and also has very, very uh, important and moving extracts. And it, it really looks at, uh, you know, before the war in Germany in, in the 1930s, uh, the ghetto period and um, the, the, the camp period, but also post-war and some of the dilemmas and the concerns that children were facing after liberation. So I would, I would definitely recommend for people who want a hi history to look at uh, Deborah Dwork's mm -hmm. book. Okay. Do you, do you have the name of the author? Deborah Dwork. D-W-O-R-K. Yeah. Thank you. It's the accent, you know. <laughs> um, did some children stay with the families who hid them? There are some children that stayed with the families that hid them who weren't uh, who weren't reclaimed, who weren't found uh, after the war. That's why we don't even know necessarily the extent of of how many survived, because some people, yes, it just be, would continue to be undocumented. But there were big efforts uh, by. Uh, Jewish organizations um, of all sorts to reclaim uh, Jewish children after the war and to bring them back to the community. Not necessarily, I mean, if they were orphaned, then they would be looked after. But yeah, for the majority, there was a movement to, to, to find children and, and, and bring them back. But there were children uh, who would remain, who weren't claimed. And for example, the case of Sally, who, who really didn't want to ever leave her, 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 her rescuers, but um, her her aunt found her and and brought her to, brought her to Canada. So and, and there's a lot of you know stories about how difficult it was for for many children to leave their rescuers who had looked after them so well sure, uh, sure. for so long. Sharon, what were some of the mental challenges for children without parents after the war? Um, I think that look, we, what we can see from the research for the most part is that children have caretakers during the war itself you know, whether it's both parents or one parent or close family or even a rescuer the ability of, of of having because children you know are emotionally reliant on the adult world and they're reliant physically on the adult world i mean you couldn't survive without the help of an adult so if you had a, a caring adult through the war period in in whatever form that was it was definitely something that gave children more resilience and it was something that children could uh, depend on and have, and they had basically had issues that there was no trust issue because necessarily always break an issue of trust because they were being taken care of and looked after. So they were always, I would say, for the most part, you know, uh, had an advantage after the war. Um, obviously, the, the case of orphan children um, is, is one where children would then struggle to find from who were, those who were very young and hidden. Uh, identity issues of who they were, who did they belong to, what was their birth date, even very, very, very simple ideas of, you know, of, of who, you know, what were the names of their parents. That took many, many years. We know a survivor who gives a testimony regularly, a woman by the name of Rena Quint at Yad Vashem, talks very eloquently about the fact that she really spent so many years uh, later on looking for her birth certificate just to know who her parents were. I mean, so... You have, it depends on the age of, of, of the children and it depends on if you were with and had caretakers with you. And then also depends on, you know, if, in, if you were lucky enough to find your, your family or parents or one parent, what emotional state they were in. You know, there were some adult survivors who, uh, who, who survived the war, but emotionally uh, were very broken and, and, and suffered. 
um, due to their trauma. And that kind of uh, relationship was also became uh, difficult. So as I said, it's a very difficult to generalize, but the, it is clear that a supportive adult caretaking model during the trauma itself definitely uh, was, was an advantage, definitely gave children uh, a lot to survive and afterwards, yep. We have a very interesting question. Was it accepted that children have become much, much more grown up or did they have to become children again? After the war? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, look, I think children for the most part, um, it's, a very good, it's a very good question because children had to reconfigure a lot after the war, you know, in terms of what's good, what's evil, not just Jewish children, all victims, uh, children of victims, and even you know children who um, were in communities of, of of perpetrators. What does it mean now that the world says you know this world was not what a good one, and, and we have to revert to something else? There had to be a lot of uh, cognitive adjustment and, and ideology and teaching and education. <clears throat> but children lost their childhood. There's a very strong sense in our survivor testimonies with children that they lost their childhood. They lost their ability to play and they lost their ability to fantasize and they lost their, their schooling and they lost their education and many after the war was very very determined to have an education and to um and to reclaim that interestingly enough there's a there's a psychologist a psychoanalyst by the name of judith kestenberg who worked extensively with child survivors and one of the things she used to do was to basically bring child child survivors together and and play play games have pajama parties have sleepovers because she felt that in her work with them they so missed that play of being children and she wanted to give that back to them in their later lives so they feel that they had that and that you know that was very powerful for for those who were involved in the groups of, of on, on, on that on that note sharon were, were there any successful therapeutic treatments or processes that help children adjust and make sense of their experiences? Um, I would say that there, there's two, two things that we could say were, were helpful. First of all, I think t a survivor, adult or a young child, who told their story to an empathic listener and gave their story to as a historical document, I think, and created a, a narrative of what happened. Uh, we see in research was was helpful. Having said that, there are some survivors who who were made were able to cope emotionally without ever speaking about what they had what they had experienced because many felt that if they began, it, they wouldn't necessarily know if they would be able to uh, to manage to manage emotionally. So, you know, the jury's out on how much we can say talking about the past was a therapeutic, but we know that those who did found it enormously helpful, and then. Child survivor groups were very, very important and very, very helpful. Sharon, thank you very, very much for a very moving and um, interesting presentation. Uh, folks, we appreciate your time and your interest in joining us tonight. And uh, we wish you uh, a pleasant evening uh, or morning, depending upon where you are in the, war in the world. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, good evening and bye-bye uh, now.